storms have I weathered, much have I lost and endured. One by one did I lose my beloved family. Just when I thought I had learned to live with my last wrenching loss, a fresh searing pain rent my soul. The whole world reeled under the shock of my brave and beloved Rajiv's treacherous end. My heart splintered and exploded. Must every person I cherish be torn from me, and so cruelly? If I rant and rave in grief, what must be the state of my precursor, my alter ego? You see, you know me today as Anand Bhavan, the family home of the Nehru's. But actually, I came much later as a replica of the original Anand Bhavan, which still stands near me, but is now called Swaraj Bhavan. Perhaps it's time you met the firstborn. Let him unfold to you the past. I am Anand Bhavan. I have stood here close to the Holy Sangam at Allahabad for over 150 years. Stood like a lone and silent sentinel guarding the treasured epochs of our history. Sheltering and caring for a family that helped shape the destiny of modern India. All these years, I have kept solitary vigil over my countless memories. Yes, solitary in the midst of the milling crowds that stand and stare, but cannot hear my aching heartbeats. But today, I want to share my memories with you. For this way, perhaps, I shall feel less lonely, less desolate. Who can recall his own birth? I don't clearly remember who first laid my foundations, or gave me shape, but my first occupant in 1872 was a renowned scholar and philanthropist. He was Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the visionary who founded the Aligarh Muslim University. But then, I was just a number. I had no name. After the death of Sir Sayyid, I changed hands several times. I passed on to Justice Mahmood, Sir Sayyid's son, who next sold me to Raja Jaikishan. The noble prince cared for me. But he soon fell upon hard times, and in 1899 sold me to a brilliant barrister of the Allahabad High Court. Motilal Nehru. It was in 1900 that Motilal Nehru made me his own and lovingly named me Anand Bhavan, the abode of joy. 
<laughs> so much like a fond mother calling her blind son Padma Lochan, lotus eyed. So, Anand Bhavan I became, and Motilal Nehru came to live here with his wife Saruprani. And the apple of their eye, their ten year old son Jawaharlal. The very year they moved in, a daughter was born to them. Ah yes, the birth of Nan, whom you later knew as Vijayalakshmi, brought great joy. And in 1907 was born little Krishna. These were my real family. But Mutinan had many close relatives and their children living under his care. For happiness, more often than not, eluded my dear, dear family. And I stood silently by, sharing their pain, and sometimes those shining moments of joy and pride. The Nehru's came originally from Kashmir, and Saruprani retained till the end much of her native orthodoxy. Surprisingly, she was a strict vegetarian. Motilal, on the other hand, was highly westernized and had a separate kitchen, a lavish one. Imagine there were two totally contrasting wings, one western, the other Indian each complete with its own kitchen and dining room. He was proud, quick-tempered, even a bit arrogant, a man of strong passions and a very strong will. And oh, he dearly loved the good things of life. Jawahar started his early education here under Ferdinand Brooks, who had been highly recommended by none other than Motilal's dear friend, Mrs. Annie Besant. Jawahar was idolized by his mother, whom he dearly loved in return. The boy was rather in awe of his father, but he also greatly admired him. Bright and energetic, with an endless zest for adventure. For me, the first wrench came in 1905. I was parted from my dear little Jawahar. The regular Anglophile that Motilal was, he naturally wanted the best of British education for his beloved son. So, the dear boy was taken away by his parents to England and put into Harrow, the famous public school for the sons of aristocrats. Apart from doing well at his studies, it was perhaps at Harrow and later at Trinity College, Cambridge, that Jabhar picked up that great English ability, the stiff upper lip. Back home, after seeing Jabhar settled in school, Motilal and Saruprani soon rejoiced at the birth of another son. But before they could get down to enjoying their baby son, he died, leaving us shocked and grieving.
life carried on tranquil for the most part. But I continued to miss Jawahar. Then, in 1912, he returned, and my whole being came alive. I was terribly proud of young Jalahar. Handsome, witty, and now a learned barrister like his father. India's political scene at the time was rather dull and tame, and I think Jawahar was restless for positive, aggressive, nationalistic action against foreign rule. He joined the Congress. Then, suddenly, in 1914, on the first day of August, the world was swept by the winds of war. The onslaught of discord rang down the curtain on the 19th century. The calm and majestic flow of Western civilization was abruptly swallowed up in a whirlpool of conflict and chaos. It was not India's war, but she was a dependency of Britain and forced to follow the dictates of her imperialist mistress. India fretted under this loathsome situation, and resentment spread to all sections of our people. But, like life itself, my memories too have golden patches. Sometime in 1916, I opened my arms as did my family, to a beautiful young person, Kamla. Kamla means Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, beauty and virtue, who sits upon a lotus or kamal. How well the name suited her. She was the daughter of Arjunlal Kaur, by the way, the Nehru's had had the same surname, Kaul, 200 years ago, before they left Kashmir. Kamla was very Kashmiri in character, proud, sensitive and totally sincere. She came over frequently and, of course, knew quite a bit about Jawahar. Not having fallen in love with anyone else, Jawahar was drawn to her and consented to marry Kamla, though she was primarily his father's choice for him to marry. As soon as the marriage was formally agreed upon, Motilal insisted that Kamla come here as often as possible. Because she came from an orthodox family and knew nothing of Western ways, Motilal arranged for Tupi to give Kamla lessons in English manners and customs to prepare her to take up her position as mistress of a highly westernized household. Strangely enough, the hot-headed, anglicized Motilal was perhaps Kamla's greatest ally in the midst of a totally alien atmosphere. It was the first day of spring in 1916, the auspicious festival of Basant Panchmi. And on this day, Jawahar and Kamla were joined in holy matrimony. I did not witness the ceremony as it took place in Delhi. But I heard every detail of the pomp and pageantry that marked that grand wedding. Once Kamla came to live here, she won all our hearts forever.
Motilal built a second floor apartment for his beloved Jawahar and his equally beloved daughter-in-law. In November 1917, a daughter was born to the young couple and she filled our hearts with joy and wonderment. The only person who was not quite ecstatic was Sarooprani, because the first grandchild was not a boy. But Motilal sharply put her right. As far as I am concerned, I do not care whether I have a grandson or a granddaughter. And in any case, this girl is going to be worth more than a thousand grandsons. Being bound with brick and mortar to my foundations, I naturally could not move. But the world and its happenings came home to me through the conversations and meetings of my family and so many important people. Motilal's decision to join Gandhiji's non-violent civil disobedience campaign against the British Raj was no sudden thing, nor was it easily taken. He had begun to take an interest in politics 35 years earlier. In 1888, when the Congress met at Allahabad, Gokhale was the great leader of the moderates. When he came to Allahabad, he received a tremendous ovation. Motilal met him at the station with our carriage. In March 1919, Parliament, I gathered, passed the infamous Rowlett Bill arming our rulers with the right to suppress political violence. To Indians, it meant the end of civil liberties in our country, and it brought Gandhiji to the forefront of our fight for freedom. Gandhiji for the first time at the Lucknow session of the Congress in December 1916. And as he told the family later, he was simply bowled over by Gandhiji straight off. I think what drew Jawahar to the Mahatma was his deep concern for the masses and the abject condition of the untouchables. I remember so well the very first time Gandhiji came to stay under my roof. Excitement and a hushed sense of expectancy mingled in the air. When he entered, I could scarce believe my eyes. Small and weazened, he wore only a loincloth and a white shawl over his bare shoulders. But his charisma was unmistakable. I stood gazing at him as if mesmerized, as did all the seniors of the family. The Mahatma stayed here for about a week. And each evening, my lawns would fill with crowds who gathered for his prayer meetings. His message brought the greatest gift, the gift of 
abhaya or fearlessness, which means not merely physical courage, but the absence of fear from one's mind and spirit. Through all this, I could sense a strange tension between Gandhiji and Motilal. My master said, Bapu, you have taken my son, but I have a great law practice in the British courts. If you permit me to continue it, I will pour great sums of the money I make into your movement. Your cause will profit far more than if I give it up to follow you. But Gandhiji was firm. No, I don't want money. I want you and every member of your family. Around that time, one day, a new servant, who did not know about the ancient cobra of Anand Bhavan, went to the storeroom to collect wood. Suddenly the cobra reared its head, and the servant bashed it in, and proudly reported his act of bravery to the mistress. Distressed and agitated, Sarup Rani ran to Motilal, who was working on his veranda. The cobra had been killed, she said, and ill luck would surely befall the family. I remember the charming smile with which Mutilal turned to his wife. Ill luck is already here, if you consider it that. For I have joined Mahatma Gandhi. What he said next sent a chill down my spine. I am going to have to sell this house, my horses and my wine cellar. We will not be able to live the way we have. Saruprani merely asked, Must you? Yes. Our son has joined Gandhiji. Would you want me not to go with him? The reply came promptly. No, I'm glad you are with your son. We shall all join the movement together. I felt so proud of her strength and his courage, even though my own future seemed suddenly bleak and crumbling about me. Gandhiji initiated the program of non-cooperation and the Congress accepted it. The Nehru's, especially Jawahar, became totally absorbed in the movement. In spite of his strong family ties, he almost forgot Kamla, Hindu, and yes, me too. I ached to soothe and shelter him from the hardships I knew he was facing as he trudged miles to distant villages. I yearned for the happy laughter of family gatherings the sparkling, lively banquets. But alas! Gandhiji took up the leadership in his first All India Agitation. He started the Satyagraha Sabha, whose members had pledged to disobey the Rowlatt Act. Satyagraha Day. I heard everybody talking about the All India Hartals and the total suspension of business. Then came the unspeakable horror of Jallianwala Bagh that sent shockwaves across the length and breadth of our country. In fact, through the entire civilized world. In the midst of all this turmoil and excitement, imagine the British district magistrate had the remarkable obtuseness to call on Motilal and say, that the government proposed to use Anand Bhavan for the visit of the Prince of Wales to Allahabad. Motilal naturally would have none of this. Seeing the magistrate's anxiety, however, 
Mutinal courteously assured him of the prince's safety. Our movement is based on peaceful, non-violent means. I can promise you that His Royal Highness will not be harmed. Incidentally, when the prince did come to Allahabad, he drove through the empty streets of an apparently dead city. In the midst of struggle and misery, there was also a spell of great happiness. Man, that is, Vijay Lakshmi, married a fine young man called Ranjit Pandit on the 10th of May, 1921. Very soon, Mutilal energetically threw himself into the business of divesting himself and his family of all worldly comforts. It was terrible to watch this princely man, so fond of the good things of life, give them up one by one. The horses and most of the dogs were sold. Many of the servants were sent away. And Mutilal's pride, his marvellous wine cellar, was also sold. Mutilal sold Sarup Rani's jewels with her consent. And Jawahar sold Kamla's. Whatever else my feelings were, I could only marvel at the influence Gandhiji had on Mutilal. Gone were all his stylish western clothes, and fastidious meals, Motilal took to wearing the simple dhoti and kurta, but he still looked the aristocrat that he was. I remember him telling Gandhiji once, I have done all these things for you, Bapu, but I am an old man now, and accustomed to certain ways. Whether you like it or not, I am going to have my two pegs before dinner. <laughs> On the 6th of December, 1921, the police suddenly surrounded me and presented a search warrant to Motilal. Smiling, he said, Of course, you can search the house, but it will take you six months to do it properly. Have you a warrant for my arrest? And the answer was, yes. Jawahar, who had hurried home from office, was also promptly arrested. I could not believe what was happening. My master and my beloved Jawahar were to be taken away to jail. How could they survive behind bars? It was unthinkable. Ah, but that was the first time you see. Later, as the years went by, I got used to their being away for innumerable imprisonments. If I seem to wander off sometimes, you must blame it on my great age and forgive me. I was desolate, but in the midst of all my pain, I could feel my heart bursting with pride. In the midst of disaster, my family led our countrymen towards dignity and freedom. House of sadness after our menfolk left. It seemed as though the life had gone out of this abode. 
to add to our distress, since Motilal and Jawahar had not paid their fines, the police came and took things of infinitely greater value to fulfill the fines. Boiling with rage, we managed to keep our tempers, all save Indu. As the elders stood by, grimly silent, Indu followed the police around, her dark eyes snapping with fury. What happened next stands out in my memory as if it had happened just yesterday. The police picked up a fine carpet worth ten times both the fines. Indu stamped her little foot and screamed, You can't take that away. It's from our home and belongs to mummy and father. Then she flew at the police inspector. Of course, the family had to drag her away. But what spirit Indu showed even then? Yes, it was a strange childhood Indu had. From the age of three or four, she heard nothing but talk of politics. Though she did not understand all that was said, her sensitivity made her intensely aware that something vitally important was happening. Even at four or five years of age, instead of playing childish games, little Indu would gather a group of servants together. Or, if they were too busy, she would line up her dolls and make political speeches to them exhorting them to work for Swaraj or practice Satyagraha. You know, I believe that though Indu adored her father and inherited so many of his qualities, she equally imbibed Kamla's quiet strength and remarkable poise. I remember one evening when Indu was about eight or nine. I saw her clutching a pillar with one hand, the other raised high. Someone asked her, what on earth are you doing? Indu solemnly said, I am practicing being Joan of Arc. I have just been reading about her, and someday I am going to lead my people to freedom as Joan of Arc did. In September 1924, a son was born to Kamla and Jawahar, but joy gave way to sorrow as the infant died within a week of its birth. To add to this, Kamla's illness was diagnosed as tuberculosis, which in those days spelt almost certain death. I looked on chilled and helpless. Motilal and Jawahar were prepared to do anything to save her. So it was decided that Jawahar and Indu would leave for Europe with Kamla for her treatment. In March 1926, they sailed for Geneva with Nan and Ranjit. Once again, I was left with my loneliness, and this time, grave fears about my dear Kamla's health. By autumn, Kamla's health still showed no signs of improvement. The doctor advised that she be taken to a sanatorium at Montana Bermala, high in the Alps near Beck, where Indu was in school. In the summer of 1927, I heard with relief that Kamla was much better. Motilal went to Europe to join the family and travel around with them. Soon after their trip to Moscow, Jawahar began to feel he'd stayed away far too long. So he returned with Kamla and Indu. It was wonderful to have my people back. 
and they were happy to be home again. Motilal returned in midwinter and immediately resumed work on the new house, what I now think of as an extension of myself, my alter ego. But at the time, my feelings were, well, not easy to describe. I felt like a firstborn must feel when after many years of being the centre of everyone's attention, a new infant suddenly arrives to capture the limelight and the family's affections. I felt hurt and neglected. I wonder if my master realised this. You know, when he bequeathed me to the Congress, he named me Swaraj Bhavan. But he called the new one Anand Bhavan. For, as he said, he could not imagine living in a house by any other name. I was touched and mollified. The graceful mansion was finally ready, just a hundred yards away and resembling me quite closely. In 1929, the family moved in. The Sears, however, warned my master that it was an unlucky place for a house, and the owner would not live long. Naturally, he paid no heed, but unhappily, they were right. Jawahar, meanwhile, had plunged into active politics ever since his return from Europe. An important happening at the time was the boycott of the Simon Commission. It was against such a backdrop that the Congress met at Lahore. Jawahar, the new president, pushed his program through easily. The Congress opted almost unanimously for complete independence. On the bitterly cold morning of the 1st of January 1930, tens of thousands of our people gathered on the banks of the river Ravi as Jawahar solemnly read to them our Declaration of Independence. Then, just imagine, ten times ten thousand voices took the pledge and roared, Swaraj ki jai, Nehru ki jai. Oh yes, I could feel the impact of that moment, even though I only heard about it through the family later. The salt tax was the most hated of Indian taxes and weighed heavily on the poor. In Jawahar's words, salt suddenly became a mysterious word a word of power. This was the signal the country seemed to be waiting for. Soon, from every city and hamlet, from coast to coast, people rushed to make salt from the sea. One day, I recall, the house was full of children aged between 10 and 15 years. Hindu was organizing what she named the Vanar Sena, to take part in the movement. Unnoticed and unsuspected, Hindus Vanarsena gathered intelligence and helped deliver important secret messages. My next memory is of the early morning of June the 30th. Motilal was arrested while still in bed and taken to join his son in Nani prison just across the Jamna. How it sickened my heart to see the exhausted but brave fighter treated thus. September, Motilal's condition was so bad that government doctors, as well as his own, recommended his release. 
Motilal telegraphed the Viceroy that he wanted no special favours. But Lord Irwin, who was humane and intelligent enough not to want a dead martyr on his hands, ordered his release. Motilal's condition rapidly worsened and Jawahar was released a few hours earlier than the others. He came home with Kamla and Ranjit. Gandhiji was freed from Yerawada jail on the same day and arrived here the next night. Now all Congress leaders who were free as well as innumerable old friends came to Allahabad. All day long, we had an unending stream of visitors. My rooms, verandas and lawns were crowded with them, speaking in hushed tones. Motilal, sitting in an easy chair, like an old lion wounded, but still very leonine and kingly, received them two or three at a time. Knowing they had come to say farewell, he would occasionally say something witty to relieve the funereal gloom. How I quaked with fear at what I knew must happen very soon. Since so many Congress members were present, he proposed that a working committee meeting be held here. Friends, decide India's fate in Swaraj Pavan. And let me be, let me be a party to the honourable settlement of the fate of my motherland. Let me die, if, if die I must, in the lap of a free India. The meeting was held, and though my master was too ill to attend it, he received the committee members once again. Then. Most of them left, but Gandhiji remained. Motilal got steadily worse, though three of the finest doctors in the country were in constant attendance. Besides Dr. Ansari, they were Dr. Jeevraj Mehta and Dr. B.C. Roy. Early in February, the doctors decided he should go to Lucknow for deep X-ray treatment unavailable in Allahabad. My master knew that his time had come and he wanted to die in his own Anand Bhavan which he loved so much. The doctors appealed to Gandhiji who finally persuaded Motilal to go. I stretched out my arms in vain wanting to hold him back hoping to wrest him from the dark jaws of death. But alas, who or what can delay the moment of reckoning? His last breath fluttered away early on the morning of February the 6th, 1931. Only Swarup and Jawahar were with him. Gandhiji, I believe, came in last and, after touching Motilal's feet, went to Sarup Rani, who was almost in a state of collapse. The Mahatma gently put his arm around my mistress and said, Motilalji is not dead. Men like him never die. He will live long. All India, even his enemies, mourned Motilal Nehru. As for me, I can never forget the moment when they brought him back to my arms. A part of me died as I saw him being carried through the iron gate. In the dusk, on the banks of the sacred Sangam, Jawahar, rendering the last melancholy service of a Hindu son to his father, lit the pyre of sandalwood.
civil disobedience was still going on. In March 1931, I heard about Viceroy Irwin's pact with Gandhiji. But the vital question of independence remained, and I knew that Jawahar was deeply troubled by the turn of events. Despite great mental conflict, he decided to follow the path chosen by the Mahatma. With Jawahar and most other leaders in jail, the women took up their work. I remember a huge outdoor meeting was held in Allahabad. I heard that when Saru Prani was introduced and stood at the tall microphone, the vast sea of humanity immediately stilled into hushed silence. Then, during National Week in April, commemorating the massacre of Jallianwala Bagh, Saru Prani was in a procession which was stopped by the police and later charged with lathis. She was knocked down and hit repeatedly on the head. When I heard of this, I could only curse my helplessness. Can you imagine? She lay unconscious in the dusty roadway with blood flowing from the wounds in her head. That night, the rumor spread through Allahabad that she was dead and angry mobs attacked the police. Jawahar, in prison, wrote, The thought of my frail old mother lying bleeding in the dusty road obsessed me, and I wonder how I would have behaved if I had been there. How far would my non-violent feelings have carried me? It broke my heart to think of Jawahar, shut away in the small prison of Almora, perched high upon a ridge. Kamla's health was alarmingly unstable, and I know how this worried him. In May 1934, Kamla left for further treatment in Europe. Alas, I was so far from that dear, delicate, noble lady during her valiant battle with death. But I gathered every detail of those painful months. The end came early on the morning of February the 28th, 1936, in Lausanne. Indu, who had accompanied her to Europe, and Jawahar were the only ones with her. Jawahar was racked with grief and a terrible sense of guilt. He had devoted so little time to his wife because of his involvement with the freedom struggle. But Kamla had never complained. Still, life has this relentless habit of going on, despite everything. But ah, what a void Kamla's death left in our lives. I tried to draw solace from her photographs, from the innumerable memories etched upon my heart over the years. Kamla was cremated in Europe, and Jawahar brought home her ashes with him. You know, he kept Kamla's ashes with him right till the end. And finally, as he had always wanted, her ashes were dispersed together with his after his death. Jawahar threw himself into his work with restless energy. But communalism began to rear its ugly head poisoning the minds of many sections of the leadership. 
the want of clear ideals or objectives undoubtedly helped to encourage it. The British government followed the policy of divide and rule, the favorite way of all empires. Able, tenacious, and unmoved by the lures of office, Muhammad Ali Jinnah achieved a respected and powerful position in the Muslim League. Jawahar wrote him many letters, seeking a solution to the conflict of ideologies. But Jinnah maintained his new theory that India consisted of two nations, Hindus and Muslims. This, as you know, led to the birth of Pakistan and the tragic partition of India. In early 1938, the entire family, for once, had gathered together under my roof. All except Hindu, who was away at school in England. After suffering two strokes in 1935 and 36, my mistress Sarup Rani seemed stronger and delighted to have the unusual pleasure of having all her children about her, instead of one or the other suffering behind prison bars. One evening, after a particularly merry dinner, Nan was preparing to return to Lucknow. Around 11 o'clock, Saroop Rani moved forward to kiss her, but suddenly crumpled. With amazing agility, Jawahar rushed to hold her before she could fall. They carried her unconscious to her bed. The hastily summoned doctor told us the mistress had suffered a massive stroke and had just hours to live. Stunned, everybody sat by her through the night. Around five in the morning, she seemed to have slipped into a quiet sleep. Jawahar, bending over her, whispered, She's gone. The situation in Europe in August 1939 was threatening. For me, the horrors of World War II seemed to recede temporarily with the return of Hindu from Europe. It was 1941 and she came home to find her father once again in Dehradun prison. Her grandmother and Bibi Amma dead, the family scattered and her beloved Anand Bhavan virtually deserted. so she could visit her father. On one of these visits, she gave him a piece of news, which until then she had kept secret, that she wanted to marry Firoz. Jawahar was terribly upset. Firoz, whose family lived in Allahabad, was a Parsi, but this was not the reason why Jawahar was unhappy. He simply felt Hindu was too young and should meet other young men before she took such a big step. At 18 or 19, Hindu had thought she'd never marry. Joan of Arc, still her ideal, she could only dream of leading her countrymen to freedom. But she gradually came to rely on Feroz's love and protective concern. And now, consent from the family was not easily won. Hindu and Feroz wanted a very quiet wedding. But in view of the clamor, they, with Jawahar, consulted Gandhiji. 
to whom they invariably turned in moments of doubt. Gandhiji told Indra that under any circumstances he would agree with her. But, he added, with a wedding as controversial as this, people would think that your father was unwilling to do anything for you, and that would not be fair to your father or to you. So, a more elaborate wedding was agreed upon, though nothing as spectacular as the weddings of Jawahar or Vijayalakshmi. Firoz went through special rituals to become a Hindu and married Hindu according to the ancient Vedic rites that had been observed by her father and all their ancestors before them. To return to the political arena, the Congress met on the 7th of August 1942 and Jawahar moved the Quit India Resolution in a rousing speech. The Indian National Congress approved the Quit India Resolution by a huge majority. The reaction was amazingly widespread. A large number of arrests were made in Bombay and all over the country. And Jawahar was interned at Ahmednagar Fort. During all the months of imprisonment, Jawahar kept in touch with his beloved daughter. He wrote to her about the rich philosophy and mystique of our land and its people down the centuries. He wrote of the dreams and wisdom of the ancients and the need to hold on to our fundamental values while striving for emancipation and freedom. ended in Europe and Asia. And then, on the 14th of June, 1945, Jawahar was released from prison. But very soon, Jawahar was summoned by Viceroy Wavell to discuss the future of India. The Viceroy called a conference of our leaders at Simla to consider the foundation of an interim government comprising representatives of the main communities and equal proportions of caste Hindus and Muslims. Gandhiji, while opposed to partition, proposed a form of self-determination whereby in the Muslim-majority provinces both Muslims and Hindus would vote on the question of separation. Jinnah insisted that Muslims alone must vote on the matter and separation must be effected while the British were in India and not after the country had become free. But alas, the country was rent in two. Then came the hour of freedom and every man, woman and child at that moment was born anew into a glorious victory and released from bondage. My Jawahar became the first Prime Minister of Free India and the nation stood behind him. As for me, I knew that his visits to me would now become even less frequent than before. The affairs of the land he loved so deeply would take him far and wide. But I could feel my heart bursting with pride. My Jawahar had lived up to his name as I always knew he would. In my loneliness, my only solace was to know that the country had at its helm a man of great vision and sincerity. 
Despite our separation, I never cease to follow every step of his career or pray for him at every turn. It was natural. After all, I had known him ever since he was a lad of ten, and I had taken him to my heart the first time he walked into my arms. Suddenly, the light seemed to go out of our lives. We were plunged into a frightening abyss, with darkness crowding in from everywhere. It seems I can still hear the gunshots that struck down our beloved Bapu at a prayer meeting in Delhi on the 30th of January, 1948. and Indira were always a great source of strength and comfort to Jawahar, especially after the blow of Gandhiji's death. By now, Firoz and Indu had two sons, Rajiv and Sanjay. And they had set up home in Lucknow, where Firoz was managing director of the National Herald. Jawaharlal was alone in Delhi and he needed an official hostess and confidant to assist him in his tasks as Prime Minister. But as always, Indira's personal life was interrupted by political necessity. Soon, she not only shifted to Delhi, but became her father's constant companion on his travels in the country and abroad. These experiences were of great value to Indira in understanding national and international problems, not only in terms of policy, but by way of personal contact and exchange of ideas. Indira was elected President of the Congress in 1959, but refused a second term because of Firoza's health. He died in 1960, and little did she know at the time that yet another blow would shortly follow. And then, on the 27th of May, 1964, the burning flame that was my Jawahar was suddenly snuffed out. And once again, the nation was swamped with despair. What is more, many thousands of our mourning countrymen found it impossible to visualize an India without Jawaharlal Nehru to lead her. As for myself, what can I say? For the first time, perhaps, I felt like raving and ranting at the injustice of always losing all that one cherishes. For the first time I realized in full measure the finality of death. I waited grimly for the family to bring home his ashes. The family arrived and the beautiful bronze urn containing Jawahar's ashes was placed on a platform which was specially built in the garden. All who loved and admired him came quietly and put flowers on it. Beside the large urn stood a little square basket that Indu had reverently placed there. When asked by Krishna what it was, Indu said, Papu always kept this with him. It is part of my mother's ashes, 
And as he said in his will, I want no part of my ashes left behind. I thought it best to submerge them with my father's ashes. Yes, I remembered the basket all too well. Jawahar may have hidden his emotions, his deep ache from the rest of the world, but I know that the little basket had stood on a corner of his dressing table and went with him to whichever room or cell he occupied for almost 30 years. I wished then that I too could have crumbled and turned to dust. But no, I told myself, I must live on despite my crushing sorrow so that generations of Indians may proudly gaze at the home of their beloved leader in the years to come. later, a small procession started from my gate towards the Ganga. My eyes followed this last journey of my Jawahar's earthly remains for as long as they could. When the family reached the Ganga, only Indra, her sons, Vijayalakshmi and Krishna went in the boat with Jawahar's ashes. Well out on the bosom of the sacred river, young Rajiv and Sanjay tilted the urn, pouring the ashes of their beloved grandfather into the Ganga. As they did so, Indu quietly immersed the little basket containing her mother's ashes. Soon the surface of the river was covered with rose petals that had been mixed with the ashes. As for the rest of Jawahar's ashes, Indu flew to Kashmir with a small urn to scatter his ashes on the high mountains and clear cold streams that he had always loved. The rest of his ashes were scattered over the entire country to mingle with the soil of his beloved land, where the peasants of India toil so that they might become an indistinguishable part of India. of Indira. She soon quelled all doubts about a woman's ability to shoulder the responsibilities of leading this vast nation. Through the dark nights of war and political strife, she stood firm, just as she shared with her people the bright sunshine of great national achievements. She toiled night and day to make India stable and proud, to give dignity to her beloved countrymen in every sphere of activity. ahead in her efforts, I rejoiced and blessed her from afar. I hardly saw her, but my thoughts were never far from her in her role as mother, friend, or as one of the most respected women in world politics. On 
on the 1st of November, 1970. At a formal ceremony, she handed me over to the Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial Trust. That was when she decided that I, in my present incarnation as the new Anand Bhavan, must also be gifted to the nation. It was in keeping with the behavior and values of a family that had already given so much to the country. Then, once more, catastrophe smote a chilling blow. And my dear, brave Joan of Arc, my infinitely beloved Hindu fell to the traitorous bullets of some misguided people. The whole country suddenly seemed to stop breathing. Shock waves ran through the whole country and sent ripples to every part of the world. I was totally lost. Once again, the ashes of a beloved one came home to me as I cringed and died within myself. I did not want to go on. I wanted to crumble and mingle with the ashes of my dear child. But then, from the darkest depths of despair, I recalled the marvelous qualities that my family had always stood for. Every member had left his stamp on the history of this glorious land, had given something precious for the country of their birth through their lives and their valor. How could I not be proud then to stand erect as a monument to their lives? How could I be so weak as to forget that the people of this land would seek landmarks of their past to pass on to their children? They would want to hold in honor the house of this beloved family which had given it all for India. Yes, my friend, my pride in the Nehru's my incalculable love for my family and my undying faith in this great land of ours have kept me alive. In your love and your sense of tradition lies my worth, my place in the annals of our history.
when you walk away, touch any part of me with the palm of your hand, and you may feel the vibrations of our entire heritage tingle through your nerve ends. A heritage of pain and suffering, yes, but mingled with joy and achievement. And, above all, a heritage of marvelous faith and courage.